Good morning. I'm Glenn Arnold. I'm a field specialist in manure application management with The Ohio State University Extension. We're going to spend time today talking about side dressing emerged corn with a drag hose. And I've got there in parentheses a new window of application time. We're trying to go the same place with manure that we're encouraging commercial fertilizer people to go and that is to use the product at the right place at the right time and the right amount. So in our instance, the right nutrient is manure. Manure is a product that we need to land apply, and the more we can do that in an environmentally acceptable fashion, the better off we are. The application of manure to farm fields is not new. It's been around for a long time, and the application equipment has really grown in, in the past 10 or 15 years. Uh, commercial manure applicators do a nice job of covering fields, as did farmers with their individual manure tankers. And uh, what I think we really want to do is to take our abilities to apply manure and get that to where we can apply manure at different times of the year. This is a survey that we have done uh, years and years ago. When we would have meetings, we would talk to um, producers and ask them what represents the best three month time period that most of their manure is land applied. And that October to December period of time was right at about 50% of the manure application. When you think of that July to September and figure the part of September that represents after silage harvest, it's probably fair, fair to say that somewhere between six and seven gallons of each 10 were probably applied in the fall after harvest of the silage or corn or soybeans. And again, our windows are dictated by the growing crop. And as our wheat acreage continues to decline, uh, we're always looking for places that we can go with manure. But dairy manure is stored outside. And generally, in addition to the manure, you have the rainwater, you have the lot runoff, you have the wash water from a milking parlor, you have cooling water from the cows, you have the runoff from the silo. So you get a lot of sources of water that flow into the dairy. And as a result, dairy manure is usually lower in nutrients. Primarily, you're pumping water when you're pumping dairy manure. Spine manure is a bit more concentrated, and primarily that is because we've got uh, the manure going down through the slats. You've got it collected below. The ammonium that's in urine and manure itself is highly water soluble. So when that all falls into a liquid pit, you'll capture a much greater amount of that ammonium nitrogen than you do with the way dairy manure is typically handled. And also, to be honest, if you look at the newer beef facilities that have been built in the state, many of them have gone to slatted systems, systems with rubber mats on top of that. And again, the manure can travel down through the rubber mats, through the slats, into the pit. And beef manure is quite uh, concentrated, even more concentrated than swine manure. This is just a typical analysis of um, a liquid sample. Again, we take swine manure in, we get it analyzed, uh, just like you would do any other type of solid manure, any other type of uh, thing you want to get analyzed. And I, I just emphasize to everyone that in liquid manures, we measure nutrients in pounds per thousand gallons. Now in this example, I'm looking at, at the line that talks about total nitrogen. This uh, sample had 37.68 pounds of nitrogen in a thousand gallons. Of that total nitrogen number, almost all of that is in the ammonium form. Remember, we said that ammonium is highly water soluble. If you can get that uh, solid manure to fall into to the uh, pit, then you're gonna capture the ammonium nitrogen. There's very little nitrate nitrogen in swine manure or any of the other manures that we work with, but there is organic nitrogen. Now in swine manure, because of the ration, because of the way the manure is handled, organic nitrogen is a pretty low part of the total nitrogen. If we were looking at a dairy manure sample, it'd be quite a bit higher than that. The other thing we look at is P2O5. Again, P2O5 in manure is the same as the P2O5 that when you buy commercial fertilizer, as is the K2O. 
If we really look at this as we've gone up and down Western Ohio and we've done plots, most of our nitrogen numbers are somewhere around that 35 to 40 pounds of nitrogen in a thousand gallons. And our phosphorus, even this sample is probably a little bit low at 12.36, but some of the newer uh, hog buildings, uh, we're looking at more like 15 pounds of phosphorus in a thousand gallons. If I look at some of the summaries that Mercer County is putting together over the years, they're closer to about 20 pounds. So if I can get my phosphorus around that 15 to 20 pounds and I can get my nitrogen up there about um, 40 pounds per thousand gallons, I get what I like, and that is a two to one ratio. I have twice as much nitrogen as I do phosphorus when we go looking at side dressing corn. And the reason for that is that if we wanted 200 units of nitrogen on the corn and we wanted uh, to look at a two year crop rotation, well, usually a corn soybean rotation is going to pull somewhere between 100 and maybe 125. Uh, pounds of P2O5 out of the soil over that two-year two period of time. So if we go in and we put uh, 100 units on of P2O5 with the nitrogen in the manure, then we know we'll pull that back out over the next two years of crop rotation. And I'd also emphasize that when we look at value of manure, about 40% or even more of the total NP and K value in that uh, manure pit, especially hog manure, is that ammonium nitrogen. So if we can capture that ammonium nitrogen, then we're really capturing the true value of that manure. And applying to a growing crop, even if it's a cover crop, is better than losing that. We started quite a few years ago with small plot work to get numbers, to find out how manure performed uh, in side-by-side -side comparisons with commercial fertilizer. So basically we put together this data set and the only thing I want to emphasize on this because many of you may have seen it before is that we're looking at the top half of this page being the um, pre-emergent plots. So everything in this top portion is pre-emergence. Everything in this bottom portion is post-emergence. So if we look at the years that we did this, from 2012 to 2016, we had about four drought years and one pretty good year in that time period. But on the 28%, we incorporated 200 units of nitrogen per acre as side dress. We incorporated 5,000 gallons per acre of swine manure as side dress, and also surf supplied 5,000 gallons per acre of swine manure. And we did incorporated dairy manure at 13,500 gallons per acre. Now that did not give me 200 units of nitrogen. So I had to add some 28% to make that work out. And then when we did the surf supplied dairy manure at that same rate of 13,500 gallons per acre, we also had to add some 28 to make that work. So when you bring that across and you look at the five year average, these numbers are in this far right column. By the same token, you come down here and look at these post-emergent plots. And these were done at V3. The treatments are the same. 200 units of nitrogen as UAN. Then we had our incorporated swine manure, our surface manure, our incorporated dairy manure, and our surface dairy manure. And then, of course, a zero nitrogen check. As we look at the numbers, we found out that incorporated manure, partly because of the moisture in the manure, the availability of the nitrogen in the manure, perhaps a little bit from the uh, Dietrich shanks, the cultivation effect, but the manure performed quite well. Over a five year period of time, we were at about 15.6 bushels per acre more for the swine manure incorporated than we were the commercial fertilizer. And the same here on the post-emergent plots. We were about 18.6 bushels higher. So that was a pleasant thing to learn at the time. And then if you looked at putting the manure on top of the ground, which we did, we gave away our advantage and actually came up about 10 to 15 bushels short of what the commercial fertilizer was. So just food for thought, if you leave manure on top of the ground, you're going to forfeit the nitrogen through the wind and the sun and all the other activities. Of course, if you got a rain immediately afterwards, it was just the right amount, maybe you would catch more of that. 
We also did these with dairy manure, and the numbers were pretty similar. You incorporate dairy manure, partly because of the moisture involved, partly because, again, the nitrogen and, and uh, cultivation effect. We did fine, and then also on the post-emergent plots at the bottom, here's the pre-emergent plots, post-emergent plots. And again, we did these pre-emergent plots at that time because we didn't know if we could ever drag a hose across corn, which we found out later we could. That's why we have the pre and the post plots. At the same time, we were working up and down Western Ohio using the university manure tanker that we got from a grant from Farm Bureau. And we did a lot of side dress plots. And essentially what we found out is that the manure performed pretty well. And it was about an even tie between the manure and the commercial fertilizer. We looked at more than 50 plots that we did up and down Western Ohio with farmers. So I think even though we worked hard to take soil compaction out of the equation, I think it's fair to say we did have soil compaction. So on this example, we've got um, payloader tires that we put on and took the big flotation tires off. We have Dietrich sweeps to try to uh, take out some soil compaction, especially behind the, the rows of the tanker. And these wheels are 10 foot on center, so there's space exactly like the outer wheels of the tr tractor that's pulling this. And again, this is a Dietrich sweep, and the thought process there is that uh, you're placing manure below the ground at the time of application, and you're trying to take out some soil compaction at the same time. Now, eventually, we switched over to a drag hose. So this is Herod Farms that was just putting uh, manure on this past spring. Um, in this example, you've got one of the, I think it's a Zoski toolbar we're pulling today. You can see that uh, we're doing 12 rows at a time. We've dropped out the center row here, and we're running one and a half to each side of that center row. You can see it's just a little bit thicker there. And also, we're running more to the outside rows for the, for the um, skip row or the guest row that we have. And they plant their fields at a 45 degree angle. And um, it's hard to see, but the corn is at the V3 stage in this field that we're going through today. And then they're skipping a 12 row pass here because they always put commercial fertilizer um, strips in to let us know how it's doing. If we looked at their five year, or uh, excuse me, set more than five years, from 2014 to 2019, if we looked at their numbers from Dark County over that time period, their six year average was a 200 bushel yield for the swine manure and 183 for the UAN. And that's a 17.3 bushel difference. And if you looked at our small plot research, that's about where we were between 15 and 18. And so this tells us that the drag hose is probably not creating a compaction issue like the tanker did. And that's allowing the uh, field results to be very, very similar to our small plot results. And Herod's, if they looked at that, they thought because of the didn't apply nitrogen and where they put that side dress fertilizer and the bushel difference times the price of corn, they thought it was worth about $157 an acre uh, for the good and their soil test levels are all in a maintenance range for phosphorus. So they do a pretty good job of keeping an eye on those numbers. If you looked at how that balances for them over a two year period of time, if we looked at 200 bushel corn and 65 bushel soybeans as an average, if we looked at the crop removal of P205 at 0.35 for corn and K2O at 0.2, and that 200 bushels of corn would take out 70 pounds of P2O5 and 40 pounds of K2O. The following year, if they went to soybeans and averaged that 65 bushel per acre yield, then for soybeans, we pull out 0.9 pounds of P2O5 and 1.14 of K2O. So that second year of that rotation, you would pull 51 pounds of P2O5 out and 74 pounds of K2O. So your two-year removal is 121 pounds of P2O5, which again, is between that 100 and 125 I'd mentioned earlier, and 114 pounds of K2O. When they put on manure at 6,500 gallons per acre, they're putting 221 units of nitrogen on the field, 117 pounds of P2O5 and 143 pounds of K2O. 
So if you looked at that over that two-year crop rotation, they would about break even on the P2O5, and they'd be a little bit over on the K2O. So you would not expect the soil test to move very much over a five or 10 year period of time that you're using this side dress as a method of um, utilizing your manure. We're running with um, counter to um, yeah. Um, we're running with units, um, counter, um, gosh darn it, got a mind break on it. But anyhow, you have a wavy colder in the front we have a boot that's putting our manure on the ground, and then we have closing wheels. So these colder tail units are what we've been running. Now this happens to be a VIT unit. You can tell by the depth control drum that they have between the rows. But again, it's, it's a, a method where we're not injecting the manure underground, but we're putting it on freshly tilled soil. I thought it'd be important to talk about the hose layout. We started out with fields that are being planted at a 45 degree angle. So when you look at a field like this, it's a square field, but the corn has been planted at a 45. And this applicator has got his hose laid out across the center and essentially will do one half of the field. And when he's all done, he'll switch over and he'll do the other half of the field. So this is how we do a lot of fields um, early on in our research and how some still prefer to do it you have a single applicator you don't need a second tractor or second operator in the field. The second method that's worked pretty successful is to put the hose extra hose on the edge of the field or you could call it the end of the field and then you put the hose humper on the end of the field as well. In this instance you've got where the hose humper is down on one end the tractor goes down makes the turn comes back and then the hose humper will hook onto that hose again. And this has worked pretty well for us. We've been very pleased with uh, the results. In quarter mile fields, this is not much of a problem. If you get to longer fields in a quarter mile or fields where there may be a large hump that we're trying to pull that hose over, then you can have issues with this. But it seems to work pretty well for us for the most part. Again, this happens to be a V3 field. The third method that's worked awfully well that I can often give credit for the farmers who required us to try this is to put the hose dead center or the hose humper dead center in a field. This is an all Grays County field. The corn has been planted. It's a V3 stage and it's going from left to right. The tractor is pointed due east and the hose is here on the west end of the field. And they'll just basically pull that hose across the field with the hose humper. And the further we go, eventually he'll have to come down and make a hook on some of these uh, loops of hose to make that work out right. Here's probably a short video that explains it just a little bit better. <clears throat> You've got your main line that's going out to the uh, field. This is a soybean field that the farmer unrolled the hose on. And then we have the drag hose going into the field and here's the hose humper tractor. And then you've got the applicator that's running down on the far end of the field. And this is a half mile field and we're able to do the side dressing by putting a hose humper in the center of the field. And yes, some corn gets run over. I won't, won't deny that, but the farmers seem to think it's really a, a good use of their livestock manure. And we've been pretty happy with the results. So if we get in behind the applicator as he's going through the field, you can see that we don't we aren't skipping any rows on this one. His application rate on this field is 5,000 gallons per acre. And you can see the hose humper is sitting there quietly and eventually he'll pull out after this is hose is out of his road and reposition himself. And this is easy for the commercial applicators to do as well. Uh, they're, you know, they're used to dragging hoses. They know what they're doing. Uh, the university has the side dress equipment as far as the toolbar. And then we've been able, we're very fortunate to be able to provide a tractor through grants and things. So again, this is a system that's worked well and we seem to be pretty satisfied with, with the results. The limitation on it is the height of the corn. Um, this corn is what we call V3 corn. And by that, I mean that this first leaf is the V1 leaf. It was the first leaf that came out of the ground. It's kind of rounded on the end like your thumb is. 
The second leaf that came out of the ground becomes the V2 leaf once it has a collar to attach to the plant. The third leaf to the right hand side has a clear collar that is attaching to the plant. So this would be V3 corn. Now we can go through the V4 stage. So when this next leaf forms an actual collar, that would be V4 corn and we're good through that. The limitation on that was that two things, I should say, before we pass it. One, that uh, you need to have a firm field to make it successful. And uh, the window of time is about 35 days from what we've worked with. Well, this is another unit that we're pretty excited to maybe sometime have a chance to work with. And this is called the Cadman Continuous Manure Applicator. This is the silver version. And in this system, you have a hose on the very end on a big roll. And that hose is basically being withdrawn as this toolbar goes down through this field. And you can see we have a frack tank here where the manure is being delivered. The pump is set up here. And then that dust is a semi tanker that's leaving the scene after depositing a load of manure in our frack tank. When they go down through the field, they pull a hard hose directly behind them. And this tractor has just reached the end of the field. So in this instance, <clears throat> he's going to make a three point turn and his goal is to make the turn <clears throat> and then head back down to the field and the hose will be withdrawn ahead of him. So here he is uh, making the actual turn. Again, that's a hard hose, not a soft hose like we were using before. So we'd have to be careful about that. You can see this wing is unfolding. And that's going to allow him to line up on the next 16 rows of corn. And then eventually he'll continue back down the field. So the strength of this system is that the corn can be quite a bit taller than what we're limited to with our soft drag hose system. Again, you can see the hose is being withdrawn down through the field as the unit's traveling. When it does get all the way back and reach the other end, essentially you can see that it's going to make the turn. It's going to fold that wing back up and then it's going to head back down the field with the hose directly behind. So you have to have a second operator in the field. You've got to have somebody alert to pull forward when you need to pull forward, release the brake on the cabin when you need to release the brake so that you can keep moving. Because again, uh, manure is being pumped continuously. And we want to head on back down the field as quickly as possible. So in this instance, they made the turn. They're going to drop the unit back in the soil. And it'll be, be uh, side dressing corn. And this is about probably V7 corn, perhaps V8 corn. So much taller than what we could do with our other systems. So I estimate that the window is probably greater than two months. And if you really did the math, that's as large as the fall application window that we often talk about when crops come off. So just food for thought for those who are adamant that this is never gonna never gonna work for them. I think it I think it will. So again, they'll head down through the field. Despite all the talk that I've talked about on incorporation of manure, I think there are still more acres of manure applied to growing crops than we do with all the incorporation that we've done. There's several commercial applicators and dairy farms that have taken advantage of the window of time provided after crops have been planted in the spring when the conditions are dry and they can get manure on top of the growing crop. This isn't quite as good incorporated probably, but still it's a window of time and you're getting a, a product applied to a growing crop that's going to be wanting that nitrogen as quickly as possible. We started a research project this past year at Ohio State <clears throat> at the research farm and we were looking at what would be the impact. Remember the H2O program allows us to have <clears throat> uh, surface applied manure incorporated with uh, with uh, tillage equipment and count that toward um, the 
payments that they can make. So we did mineral application to V3 corn in 2020 at the OARDC research station. We used our 28 as our, as our check, so to speak. We did incorporated manure and we did surface applied manure that was cultivated in the next day per the H2O agreement. So the yield, again, a drought year at Whiteville, they're really big on droughts at that location, I think. But we were about 94 bushels of corn for, 20, for um, the 28 incorporated. The incorporated manure, again, manure always excels during dry years, uh, was 131.1. But when you look at that surface applied manure, and again, we were using a rate of 5,000 gallons per acre to get the 200 units of nitrogen that we wanted. And so 5,000 gallons per acre of manure is not very much when you think of an acre inch, you know, an inch of water on an acre is 27,154 gallons. So we're doing 5,000 gallons, not 27,000. So when you look at that, that was a pretty impressive number for such a dry, miserable year that we dealt with there, growing season. So again, we're gonna repeat this for the next couple years, but it does give us a lot of hope that if you surface apply manure to growing corn, there's a really, really good chance that you'll capture a lot of those nutrients. Now the book values would tell us that we incorporate within a three day period of time, we would capture most of that nitrogen, but it's really nice to see it firsthand. So hopefully a year from today, we'll have some better yields, more impressive yields to report. We also been doing some work with uh, dry hosing on soybeans. And so we flattened beans at the V3, V5, and V7 stage, thanks to the Ohio Soybean Council grant. And we did this for three years now, and I think we're wrapped up with that project. And the purpose of the research was to find out in an emergency, if we needed to put manure on soybeans, would the drag hose be tolerated by the beans? And generally the answer is yes. Uh, through V3 and V5, there was no, um, obvious dry hose damage, no reduction in yield, the plants looked good, even where the tractor drove through at the V3 and V5 stage, there was very little yield reduction. And we drug this with a 30 foot um, bar across here, and that, and that gave us the opportunity to measure yield damage from the hose only on one side and the other side too, and then yield damage where the tractor drove through. <coughs> This is V7 damage. And I thought it would be good to show these pictures. When you look at how these beans were snapped off when the drag hose went through at the V7 stage, and it didn't kill them, but it snapped them off. So they grow sideways, three to five inches, and then they turn back upward. And here's another one. It's grown sideways and turned back upwards. Again, it leaves you pods of beans that are on the, laying on the ground of the, or surface of the soil. Um, the beans themselves are going to get behind the, uh, the competition there. So V7 is probably too tall, but again, you, you don't know till you try it, till you push it a little bit. We also started another project where we, put, we did put swine manure on soybeans this year at the um, V3 stage and it yielded statistically similar to beans that did not receive manure. The other reason we looked at this research is that we commonly put manure on beans to start the um, um, double crop beans. You know, you'll go out there after wheat, you'll put beans in the ground and they'll splatter manure on top. Or well, what if weather prevented you from getting out there as soon as you were expecting to and the beans did get out of the ground. Well, we know that we don't want to put manure on when the cotyledons are the only things showing because you'll, you'll burn the soybeans off. But when they get taller, there may be some potential for that. So our goal is we want to use manure to fertilize growing crops. It's kind of another tool in the toolbox, another time in the window of the year that we can apply manure to farm fields. We're also trying to capture nitrogen that's often been wasted since we evolved to the liquid systems more than 40 years ago. Again, you're applying both nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash to a growing crop. And we're trying to integrate liquid manure into modern crop production, trying to find a place where that's going to work and work very, very well from our research that we've done so far. And we just emphasize it's the right nutrient in the right place at the right time and in the right amount. Now, for those of you who are Facebook type people, 
um, we try to post a lot of videos and a lot of plot results on our university Facebook page because we know social media is one of the fastest ways to get information out and to share. And our Facebook page is Ohio State Extension Environmental and Manure Management. And I really get a chuckle when I see other farmers and livestock producers and commercial manure applicators post successful results uh, from their manure application efforts on growing crops and on uh, other ways that they're using manure to be creative. So social media seems to be a very good way to uh, share a lot of that information and I welcome anyone who wants to follow us. With that, I've concluded our talk this morning. I hope that you found it informative. I hope you enjoy the Conservation Tillage Conference. It's unfortunate that we had to be in this virtual format, but like everything else, we'll make the best of, of the day as we can. Thank you very much.